Welcome to Musings and Modalities. I'm your host, Tristan Stowicki. Think of me as your pragmatic shaman bestie. Join in with other high vibe, lovely people as I unravel spiritual ideas to help create change and growth in your life. I cover a variety of spiritual topics, sharing knowledge to meet you wherever you are in your journey. As a shaman, astrologer, and human design reader, I help you understand how to make informed decisions and incorporate different modalities using discernment in your own intuition. Today, you will gain powerful shamanic healing tools you can use to incorporate spiritual practices in non-traditional ways. Whether you're just beginning or need a knowledgeable best friend with the next phase of your journey, I'm here to help. Stay tuned. Musings and Modalities starts now. Everyone and welcome to Musings and Modalities. I'm Tristan Stowicki, your pragmatic shaman bestie, and for the next 30 minutes, we'll be diving into the topic of legit or full of it to help guide you as you search for and start working with healers. Now, there are a few topics I want to explore within this theme, as it's a question I get pretty often from those I meet out in the world or from family and friends. And it can be really hard to pinpoint exactly who's best suited to help you or even the type of support that you're looking for. And as the spiritual community continues to grow and expand, which is both beautiful, but also it can also feel really overwhelming um, to try to choose who to work with. So to provide some guidance on this topic, I'll break down the differences between an energy healer, an intuitive coach, and a shaman. Um, when I talk about energy healer, you may also hear me use the term energy practitioner. Um, and I'll also kind of cover some common red flags as well as some green flags um, to help avoiding wasting, you know, your time and money as you start figuring out who to work with. So let's dive into working with an energy healer or energy practitioner and what that actually means. So an energy healer typically has a certification for a specific type of energy healing. Um, some examples are Reiki. There's also Archangelic Light, uh, which works with the energy of Archangels. Um, and there are many, many others. Um, I've worked with several different types, and by no means have I worked with all of them because they continue to expand. Um, and what uh, this kind of certification means is that they have received specific training um, from a healer that has achieved the master level. Um, and can pass along these teachings. Um, so in this style of training, the energy healer has been granted attunements, which open up kind of the energy and the energetic body um, to allow source energy to pass through. And that can happen in a weekend session or over several sessions um, throughout their training. So to dive into this a little bit more, um, I'm going to talk about Reiki specifically. Reiki is an incredibly powerful and common energy healing modality, and it's probably a term you've heard before or seen. Um, and Reiki has several levels. So there's the first, second, and then master level, also known as the third level. And at that level, you can really begin teaching others and passing on the attunements which you've received and have worked to embody, um, because there are some time restrictions where you have to embody it over at least six months at each stage before you can move on to the next one. Now, there are also different types of Reiki. There is Yusui, Holy Fire, Animal Reiki, and others. And with Reiki, um, symbols are drawn to call upon energy from source for the purpose of removing stagnant energy, adding in lovely supportive energy um, for energetic shifts during times of stress and transition. Reiki can also be used in helping clear old energy from objects or homes. And when I'm working with animals, Reiki is such a gorgeous energy that opens up communication um, and can offer healing if the animal needs it or if the animal is taken on energy from humans. So you can see there's already a variety of uses that's incredibly powerful and lovely. Now, I do want to call out if you've been to a metaphysical shop or fair, I'm sure you've seen items where an energy practitioner has added Reiki or other energy modalities to them. Um, so that could be candles or pendants or crystals, um, which is such a beautiful thought that you can not only have, you know, a beautiful crystal, but hopefully it has lovely supportive energy in it. Um, I do want to ask that... Um, you kind of research the practitioner if you can, or just make sure that the energy really works with yours. Um, because before I work with people, and I'll dive into this more later, I really want to vet their skills and the values they have and making sure that any practitioner is acting with integrity before purchasing from them. And that might not be as easy if you're purchasing from a, um, a market or you know a specific shop, but I would really just tune into your own intuition um, and making sure that feels like the right move for you. 
Now, I don't say that to cause any fear about Reiki. Um, I use Reiki every single day. I use it. Uh, I, you know, use the symbols. I draw it on my water. Um, I use it just constantly. Um, there's symbols that I have in my home quite a bit that I draw and just and use. Um, it's incredibly powerful tool that helps with clearing chakras, which I do frequently for myself and for my family. And it also really helps my clients get back into a higher vibrational energy when I use it in session in a really beautiful and supportive way. Um, so if I have a new client or someone that's very new to energy work, I always start with Reiki as it allows them to experience energy directly from source that's filled with pure love and consciousness and just that unconditional support feeling that we often don't feel day to day. So next, I wanted to move on to coaching. Um, so coaches help with specific goals or a specific mindset, mindset shift. For instance, um, if I wanted to write a book, I could hire a coach to help me set clear milestones to hit that goal. They could provide coaching on how to build time in my day for writing. They can share what software they recommend for editing or um, what they recommend if I wanted to kind of speak rather than type out a book, things like that, right? And so what coaches do is they really use their experience, and sometimes they also use intuition or use the term intuitive coach. Um, and what that intuition does is help them uncover potential roadblocks or challenges before I or the client that they're working with reach them. Um, these coaches can also use intuition to see if they're at limiting beliefs um, with maybe if there's any challenges with the term uh, author or writer, um, as though, you know, we're waiting for someone to bestow these terms upon us, like now you are a writer, now you are an author. Sometimes it can be hard to kind of take those on ourselves. Um, and coaches can also help me um, overcome those limited beliefs through their techniques that they have rather than using energetic tools. So it's just two different options to hopefully achieve the same goal. Other tools coaches use are weekly structured calls or frequent check-ins um, to hold you accountable and that are related to this goal specifically. They also encourage calendar apps uh, to schedule in time for creativity and you know really keep you moving forward as you try to hit different milestones within a goal. Um, they may even have recommendation for book designs in this example, or um, they might have, you know, where they um, recommend some social media folks to help after the book is written to help with marketing and things. Coaches can also offer valuable insight into different industries, right? So maybe you're not really sure that you have a specific goal yet, but you want to either change industries or you want to learn something new. And so they can help with learning jargon. They can help reduce the intimidation of trying something entirely new, which is you know, kind of challenging for sure. Um, and there are also intuitive life coaches who can help you and who can help like see patterns within your lifetime and how to move through them from a beautiful, unbiased way. It's always nice to have unbiased feedback, which coaches really, really do well. Um, and they also, you know, if you're doing a big, scary goal, like starting a business or, you know, completely changing to a new industry, changing jobs, they really can help you with accountability and have you work through their tried and true processes. Um, you know, where hopefully you're achieving success that their other clients have. So ultimately, their focus can be a bit more singular in nature, and the engagement is really clearly defined where they're helping with a specific goal you have, and your sessions and follow-ups are mostly focused on that goal. Now, before moving on to discuss shamans and how they work differently to coaches and energy healers, um, I definitely want to acknowledge that people are multifaceted, and it's really common for intuitive coaches to also have training in energy modalities, or for energy practitioners to also offer coaching and sessions with clients, um, which is fantastic. Like, I love meeting people and working with people that are multifaceted, that have a whole toolbox to help me because I feel really secure in the knowledge that they'll help me achieve the success I'm looking for. Um, I also love the energy work and coaching is much more mainstream now. Um, I just want to make sure that you understand the qualifications and differences so you can decide who to work with for your best results and as you need different things. So shaman, of course, so excited to talk about this. So a shaman is able to reach altered states of consciousness and use that ability to do soul retrieval, retrievals and help mend what caused the soul to split and ultimately bring it back, which is kind of heavy, right? That's a big, big power. That's a big, big move when necessary. 
Shamans are also able to use perceptual states that go beyond our reality that we're currently experiencing for many purposes. So one of which is to check on trajectories, right? And so they're able to work with you to review decisions in your life and track into how your life would be altered if another road was chosen. And that's a lot. So I wanted to bring in some examples here to kind of talk through this. Um, so I'd actually worked with a shaman to release the idea that if I had moved to New York at a pivotal time in my life, right before I started college, um, where I stayed very you know, close to home, and I had two options. I could stay close to home or I could move to New York and go to film school. And so I, in choosing to stay close to home, you always have that dream or that mindset that, wow, or that longing even of how would my life be different if I had moved to New York and went to film school? You know, would my life be better? And it was such a beautiful and healing experience to work with a shaman to learn that I'm in fact on the highest trajectory now. And we did this, you know, over a full session. There's a lot of details I'm leaving out, but basically the end result is that my life would not be better off if I had made the choice to go to New York and go to film school. And that was such a supportive decision that the shaman made to take me through that journey because it allowed me to release any limiting beliefs I had that I'm not set up to achieve my goals in this lifetime and also made me appreciate the life that I have now. Um, so ultimately, it was a profound experience to kind of remove any residual doubt and feel supported and really loved from the universe. So the medicine wheel or wisdom wheel, which is used in many shamanic trainings and traditions, really took me on a journey through each of the four directions. So south, west, north, and east. This journey came with rites bestowed on me by my teacher, and these rites instilled archetypes to help as guides for both myself and my clients. So in this training, I experienced numerous sacred journeys for additional wisdom and unlocking new levels. I learned how to conduct fire ceremonies and use sand paintings. And sand paintings are beautiful. They're the creation of a sacred circle of art. And you use things found in nature or things that are, are of significance to you. And what you do is you can leave it outside for several days, um, three days a week, you know, longer as you feel called. And you can see the items move. Um, and you can see maybe where things are a little bit more stagnant, if there is a significance to each item that you put down. And you can really see the old energy change, um, which is so beautiful. Every one of the sand paintings I've done has just a special place in my heart. This training was a two-year journey, right? That's ultimately a lifelong journey. And with all of the teaching and many, many hours of learning and training that I've had, I'll still be called to work through the medicine wheel several more times in my lifetime, minimum, right? And I'll still continue to learn, um, you know, and expand in this way because uh, shamans have access to incredibly powerful tools. And um, it's so important to continue to grow and expand that as clients and as people and as the world needs more help and support. So with working through the medicine wheel and going through those, you know, two plus years of training, it was truly the most challenging, rewarding experience I've ever had and most rewarding thing I've ever done. Um, and I haven't talked a lot about this, you know, in previous episodes, but um, I do have my MBA. I've worked on multi-million dollar projects for very complex technical systems. I've led software engineers for many, many years and many, many teams. And so I've had an entire life before my shamanic training in extremely corporate environments, working for some of the biggest brands in the world. And so I don't say it lightly that this was very challenging and also very rewarding. Um, and with this being the hardest thing I've ever done and I've ever gone through, I also have so much more to learn and body and grow into. And so, you know, outside of talking about my training, just to kind of share the differences between, you know, some of the trainings that either coaching or uh, Reiki practitioners go through. Um, I also want to call out the beautiful and powerful gifts um, that as a shaman, I'm able to use in sessions with clients. So some of that includes working with archetypes like Ser Serpent and Odorongo, um, and those allow me to help better understand my clients' experiences in this life and past lives, and how we can transmute and clear that energy um, without losing the wisdom from those experiences. There are also tools like entity extraction, um, physical body shifts to help shift dis-ease, working with the energy of protection and transmutation, 
on a level that can only be described as magical. Like every single time I'm in a session with clients, there's so much magic and power that comes through no matter what tools being used. Um, that is just so lovely and wonderful. And I'm, I'm so humbled by it. And these are just a few of the tools and gifts that shamans have access to. I know the word shaman feels so um, all-encompassing. It feels like a big word, right? Capital S. And I wanted to break down a little bit more into what exactly that means and how that's different from other modalities. Um, and I also want to make it clear that just because shamans have the ability to use these tools, it doesn't guarantee that they will. Um, so for instance, if I had a client come to me to run a trajectory or to review decisions in her life, and if my guides or my intuition were saying like, actually, this isn't going to be helpful, this is going to, it could potentially be harmful, or it just could have some unintended consequences, then that's something I definitely wouldn't do. Um, ultimately, this is for the highest and best good or whomever I'm working with or even myself. And so I have really strong boundaries of when to use or not to use a tool. That doesn't mean, though, that I'm not able to work with that person, right? So I could work with this person in other ways where we could work to remove limiting beliefs or use some other tools that are appropriate for the situation. And I really say that example to say the level of responsibility increases as your gifts and energy do. So I'm very careful to always have consent and to check in on what's best for my client first. Um, I intentionally try to use the most gentle of tools and then pull out bigger energy tools if needed, but truly only if needed. I do, I do this to not only support my own energy, right? Because if you're always coming in at a 10 every session, like that can be extremely draining. Um, but it's ultimately also to respect the downtime and recovery on a client's body. Um, if there's something like a soul retrieval is deemed necessary, um, you can understand that there's downtime with that. And that could have um, effects where maybe they're not able to give 100% at their job or, they're, you know, if they're a parent, they maybe need to um, have someone help with childcare during that time. So I really want to work with clients to make sure that any um, impact from energy healing where there is downtime that they are able to make accommodations as needed. Um, I also want to closely monitor and check in on clients during and after sessions, especially with those that have had a lot of energy transformation or release. I don't want to overload them in their system, right? It would be completely irresponsible of me to wield this power without closely monitoring it. And it's also icky, just like straight up icky. If I were to use massive amounts of energy on clients just to prove that I can, um, I I find that just um, not necessary in any sense. Like I have confidence in my abilities and that's just kind of not how I feel a need to work with people or a need to exert power in that way. As I wrap up talking about shamans, I want to mention um, some overlap in tools with past life healing and clearing through Reiki um, and the abilities that shaman, shamans have. So as a client, I've worked with both Reiki masters and shamans, and ultimately I have found the tools available to shamans have had a more profound impact on me and are more consistent in achieving incredible results. That isn't to say though that Reiki and other energy modalities aren't incredibly powerful tools because they are. I've just found um, for me specifically in my experiences that the toolbox and lineage support and overall um, abilities that a shaman has access to um, has just been a stronger experience overall and a cleaner experience um, where I haven't had to go back over several sessions or still have some residual things to work through. Now I want to move into red flags. So energy is precious. It's your vitality. It's your life force. And giving someone access to your energy is an important decision and should not be taken lightly. So I wanted to include some red flags that I've seen or experienced in my own healing journey to help you avoid working with someone who isn't acting in integrity or who frankly isn't helping anyone but themselves. So if it's very challenging to work with them or book with them, or if there's a lack of presence through a website or social media, it's a bit of a red flag to me. Um, if there is a lack of legitimate business setup, that could definitely be a red flag, especially if it isn't clear what service you're purchasing, or if you have no idea about kind of what certifications or training that they have. Um, if there are repeated comments on social media calling them a scammer or 
if they have pending lawsuits um, for not providing services that were paid for. It's definitely a bit of a red flag for sure. Um, I've also seen where they don't feel the need to better their skills. And um, this is also coupled with they can make wild claims um, about either results their clients have seen or just claims in general that feel so unbelievable that it it feels untrue. It feels like fr uh, fiction. Um, if they make a point to show bank statements or discuss their income to the point you know more about their income than your own, that is a big, huge, massive red flag to me. Um, that's not really something I want to engage in personally. I did want to include this one, which is at a minimum, a yellow flag, and that is extreme transformations in a very short amount of time. So as you level yourself up and learn new things, time is really needed to embody new learnings and new levels. Um, so for instance, in my own journey, I did not offer energy healing for a very long time after I got my certifications. I was clear to at different points, but I went through three separate energy training sessions over many months with different teachers. And I really wanted to work on myself and really embody and step into, you know, working with Reiki for myself, my close friends and my family at different points um, before sharing these gifts with the world. You know, I wanted to give myself time to really embody and live the values that the energy modality encompasses and to make sure that, you know, my intentions when sharing energy are very pure and well-intentioned. Um, I also personally don't think a weekend or a one day class is enough time to learn a new skill and immediately start charging others for it. Um, so, you know, in the example, if we think about a product, right, like a bath bomb, and I took a one day training to learn how to make it or a weekend training. I'd probably make them for myself first and those in my house so I could test how the scent works, you know, see how my skin reacts to the recipe, you know, test out all the product variables. I wouldn't immediately jump to selling them to strangers before even offering them to my family and friends for feedback and further refinement. And so that's really kind of what I think about in this example of letting someone sit and embody any new skills. I've also found that arrogance um, is, a, is a major red flag, um, and some of the most powerful healers I know are filled with such humility and gratitude, and so um, these red flag statements are like, I'm the most powerful person I know, or um, everything that they say um, just has kind of an ick factor that goes beyond strength and being confident in their skills, and it can really feel ego-driven, um, and it can really seem like they have some insecurities to work through. Um, in a session, if they claim to be omniscient or give you definitives, um, or if they're giving very drastic advice that makes you feel um, kind of gross in your own system, um, that's a red flag. I was reading on a discussion board recently that someone was told very directly she needed to close her business um, as it's going to fail. And this was the first session she had with a, a person. Um, I don't want to call them a healer because so I'm going to call them a person um, because I find that information or that advice dangerous. Um, I think there's a difference between saying that there could be upcoming challenges with a business or helping someone work through any challenges or there could be trade offs in your life. Um, but to say, you know, something extreme in that nature um, is really upsetting um, because that kind of lives in someone's brain and could have really um, negative effects and consequences in their life uh, that goes beyond this one session they've had with someone. And ultimately, it's kind of evident to me that the person offering this session and this service um, has a lot of healing to do and that her opinions are just a reflection of her own limitations and insecurities. Now, there are hard truths that come up in sessions, but definitively spewing of information that preys on someone's fears, which a business failing as a business owner is a massive fear, right? Like that is so dangerous and can completely change the course of someone's life. Um, so that is a very wild and extreme example, but something that I just want to call out so you can be on the lookout for. Now, shifting the energy, let's get back to green flags. Let's get back to higher level. So I want you to hold any person you're paying a service to to a high standard, especially when they have access to your energetic body. 
I expect the coach, the energy practitioner, the healer or shaman to be professional, right? I want them to show up to sessions on time and have integrity. This should be no different than the standard you have for a medical doctor or a therapist, right? So as a baseline, there should be a shared understanding and respect no matter who you're working with. The person that you're working with should explain what they are doing and answer any questions you have, then confirm they have your consent to do whatever energy work is needed very specifically, and then they have your per, uh, permission to proceed. With this kind of work, I expect, especially if you work with the same person over many sessions, that they have a level of vulnerability where they share if something's new to them or um, if something they're you know open to trying but are still learning about. I really love that. I encourage that. That is a, a full green flag to me, and I'm always honored to work with them in this way. Some green flag traits include humility and strength, gratitude, curiosity, and openness, they need to be receptive to feedback, um, especially if something isn't working for you in a session. They need to be open to that. And they should also be open to respectful skepticism. Um, you know, they should explain everything to the best of their knowledge and kind of what their take is and make no attempt to convince you of anything. That's not their place. That's not their job. And of course, they should check in on you during the session and make sure your physical body can handle the level of energy work they are providing. If you've never had Reiki or any kind of energy work before, it's very normal to feel tired during a session or need a snack. Um, so making sure that you're both taking care of yourself and that the practitioner you're working with understands that and shares that with you. All right. So if you're someone that has worked with many different types of energy practitioners, coaches, or shamans, so please know it's normal to outgrow your coaches as you continue to level up. I have so much gratitude to my past teachers and those I've worked with, and I can also acknowledge that I've moved beyond what they can help me with at this point. It's good to have awareness for the echo chamber that is the spiritual community, especially on social media. So I recommend if something is trending to seek validation or understanding from sources outside of that community um, to do your own research, to see what data, facts, or science are available, and always use your own discernment to see if what others are talking about feels true and real to you. I really hope this episode helps as you continue on your journey and look to coaches, shamans, energy practitioners to reach new heights. I so appreciate you watching Musings and Modalities with me, your pragmatic shaman bestie. Tune in on the second and fourth Mondays of each month at 8 a.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. Eastern for more fabulous episodes. Um, as a reminder, I offer free 30-minute consultations if you have additional questions on how I might be able to help and to see if it's a full-body yes to work with me. And as always, you can book a 60-minute shamanic healing session with me at musingsandmodalities.com. Thank you so much for listening. You've been listening to Musings and Modalities with me, Tristan, your pragmatic shaman bestie. For more powerful healing tools, join me every second and fourth Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific on Transformation Talk Radio. I cover a variety of topics to meet you wherever you are at on your spiritual journey. Learn techniques to work with pendulums, past life healing, astrology, and more. Please share the show and subscribe for more guidance from your pragmatic shaman bestie at musingsandmodalities.com.